Good morning to all. Before we begin this webinar, let's invoke the blessings of Almighty through a prayer. Nam Haradharam Vishnu Our principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty, to welcome our resource person, Professor Lokesh K.M., Department of Studies in History, Mangalo University, Mangal Gangotri, Konaje, and all those who are present here. Over to you, sir. And Dr. Lokesh K.M., Professor of History, Mangalo University, respected correspondent and secretary of Women's National Education Society. Sir Shri K. Devananda Pai, respected correspondent of Bazar PU College and member of Women's National Education Society, Sir Shri Beltangadi Ganesh Krishna Bhatt, IQAC NAC coordinators, conveners of the webinar, dear colleagues and dear participants. At the outset, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to this webinar. A very warm and cordial welcome to you all. Before I could go for the formal welcome and in introduction of the resource person, I would like to give you a brief introduction of the topic for today's webinar, Epidemics and Pandemics, India's Experience Under Colonialism and After. Epidemiological study on the colonial period reveals that between 1896 and 1921, over 30 million people fell prey to epidemic diseases like uh, plague, cholera, malaria, smallpox, and influenza. Of these 10 million belong to Punjab, Northwestern province, uh, Frontier Provinces, Bombay. Punjab often proved to be the epicenter of cholera and plague outbreaks. 12 major cholera outbreaks were record, recorded, killing 2.5 million people, excluding the fatalities induced by malaria, smallpox, and influenza. We also have interesting stories about the infection at Jammu and Kashmir. That incident took place at the Bunny Hall Road, the mysterious death of a, a person in the Kashmir Valley. So on 76 out of 4,200 laborers got infected. The mortality rate was as high as 56%. Even those Amarnath Yatris who passed through without the knowledge of this incident got infected. So also, Bombay Plague, 1896, killing 12 million. This probably forced the government to introduce the Epidemic Diseases Act, 1897, appointed a, a spies to report the diseases, raids on the residents and shifted the patients to the camps, village officials being made responsible for providing food and other necessities to the quarantined victims. There are reports pertaining to the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir rewarding do to those who report the cases with cash and punishment to those concealing the cases. We also get information about the public responses Information about the reasons for which the epidemics were not contained like poor sanitation, scarcity of drinking water, education, mobility of the working class and laborers. Of course, the colonial government was reluctant to stop. 
the movement of the working class with the fear that that would it would affect the exchequer that is why no lockdowns imposed as rightly pointed out by david arnold in his study epidemics in colonial india that resistance to plague measures reveals reveals around bodily evasion and concealment to evade intrusive state medical and sanitary measures there are other positive developments like evolution of public health laboratories scientific inventions construction of hospitals roads and transport etc against this background we wanted to have a strong historical bearing of what happened during the colonial period and how the situation is handled by the uh, present government the resource person will definitely throw light on these aspects i have great pleasure in introducing the resource person dr lokesh km to this august audience dr lokesh km is a recipient of commonwealth post doctoral fellowship 2002 and 3 he had many publications to his credit some of the books published by him include western civilization 1648 1945 anthropological compendium of the on the caste and tribes found in the province of korb identity formation the experience of the 19th century kodavas of korb independence undivided south kendra and contemporary colonial kodagu and contemporary history in the historical perspective abaka queens a metaphor for cultural harmony overseas contacts and trade through the ages the very community during the colonial period they survey sir mirza ismail and the kurg congress movement in princely mysore mysore captivity of the kendra christians and the tipu sultan a study in the perspective of the catholics of kenara identity formation the experience of the 19th century kodavas of korb odupu district in colonial gazetteers tribal resistance and the fall of roman empire crisis in europe and the cold war post independent in the undivided south kendra and contemporary situation kodago colonialism and after these are some of the books which are and articles published by the resource person of today's program with this i on behalf of uh, the management on behalf of the correspondent staff on on behalf of the participants extend a very warm and cordial welcome to you sir respected correspondent and the secretary of women's national education society sir k devananda pai is our strength and a source of inspiration by his outstanding dedicated service is a role model to all of us i extend a very warm and cordial welcome to him for his gracious presence a very hearty welcome to our management member and the correspondent of western national pu college sir shri bertengade ganesh krishna bad welcome to you sir i congratulate the conveners of the webinar mr ganesh pai the co convener mr rakesh shetty well supported by the dedicated team of staff members thank you all for your dedicated and sincere service a warm and cordial welcome to you all as rightly pointed out by many this covid is an opportunity for the teachers to adapt to the changes this is our 12th webinar with the 19 quiz programs three more webinars and one fdp is on the queue this speaks about the hard efforts put in by our colleagues acknowledging their hard work i wholeheartedly welcome all of them to this webinar a very warm and cordial welcome to the iqsa coordinator mr sayed kader nag coordinator dr pravin kumar kesi for the initiative in organizing this webinar i extend a very warm and cordial welcome to all my colleagues for their support in the in quality initiative measures special thanks to the technical staff mr ritesh and mr ravindra murthy last but not the least i extend a very warm and cordial welcome to all the participants for attending this webinar thank you have a fruitful session ahead
Thank you, sir. I now request the secretary of WNES and the correspondent of BWC, uh, Shri K. Devanand Pai, sir, to speak a few words. Good morning, everybody. It is a wonderful experience for me to learn about what has happened in the last couple of centuries in the context of the present pandemic coronavirus disease. My fellow member of the governing council, Mr. Ganesh Krishna, but the principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty, the resource person, resource person, Professor Lokesh K.M. Mangalore University, head of the Department of History, Professor Ganesh Pai, Professor Rakesh Shetty, head of the IQC, Professor Sayyad Kadha, the party's prince, ladies and gentlemen. Pandemic is defined as an epidemic occurring worldwide or over a wide area across the international boundaries and usually affecting a large number of people. The classical definition in includes nothing about population, immunity, virology, or disease severity. The, the novel coronavirus cases have been confirmed in a large number of countries due to which the World Health Organization on 11-3-2020 has characterized COVID-19 as pandemic. An epidemic disease is one affecting many persons at the same time and spreading from person to person in a locality where the disease is not permanently prevalent. Metaphorically, epidemics is a rapid spread or increase in the occurrence of something usually with a negative or humorous connotation. The dem demic part of epidemic and pandemic from the Greek demos means people of a district However, pandemic appears to be most commonly used in the context of epidemiology, while, which is concerned with the infectious disease. The first records of epidemic in English come from mid 1600s from the Greek endomos. And the Greek root demos means people. The basic meaning of endemic is with a certain area or certain people. As we mentioned, it is unsurprisingly easy to confuse these two words. For example, if something is spreading like a wildfire, it is an epidemic. And if something has already spread beyond certain control and currently massive in its reach and impact, it is a pandemic. The Spanish flu of 1918, though it was not exactly known where it originated from, and it is estimated to have affected one third of the people across the globe. Generally, people not only call COVID-19 both an epidemic and a pandemic, but they do also call it an outbreak. An outbreak is a sudden breaking out or occurrence or eruption of an infectious disease affecting a relatively localized area. However, in official medical and scientific communication, it is important not to confuse a local epidemic with a pandemic because that implies the outbreak spread all over the world. Before I conclude, I wish this webinar all the best. I would like to congratulate the HOD of History, Professor Ganesh Pai, and their team for conducting this webinar at an appropriate time. Further, I wish the people around the nation to stay safe. Have a nice day. Thank you. I request the Thank you, sir. I request the participants to mute your audio and put off your video. And the participants may also post your questions in the chat box, which would be addressed by the resource person at the end of the session. Let's now begin the session. Over to you, sir. Professor Lokesh K.M., Department of Studies in History, Mangalore University, Mangala Gangotri, Konaji. Over to you, sir.
Thank you very much. Uh, namaskara and good morning everyone. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for the college, Besson and Women's College for organizing this uh, meaningful seminar on a very interesting and uh, important topic, epidemics and the pandemics <clears throat> in the world with special also take this opportunity to thank Professor Satish Kumar Shetty and his staff and also the members of the management council for giving me an opportunity to share my ideas and also information with you people as far as epidemics in India is concerned. And as the topic says, uh, we are going to deal with the epidemics that actually affected India during the colonial period and also after independence. It's a very, very vast topic and therefore I will be very specific to uh, some issues and I'm not going to give you a you know, lot of details on various epidemics that broke out in India and affected the Indians. And here we are focusing more on colonial period because many of these deadly diseases actually took place in India during the colonial period. And the effects of these uh, diseases are still influencing our day-to-day -day activities as well as our public health issues. So I'm happy that uh, Mr. Devanand Pai has uh, defined the various words associated with uh, these diseases, whether it is uh, outbreak or whether it is endemic or whether it is uh, epidemic or pandemics, etc., etc. And he has rightly, as he has uh, rightly said, well, academic I'm sorry, epidemic is the outbreak of a deadly disease and uh, uh, you know, affecting a large number of people within a nation. And when an epidemic actually crosses the border of a nation and becomes international or grows global, well, it becomes a pandemic. And in the world history, if we uh, go through, we will come across a number of uh, pandemics taking place in different parts of the world, whether it is uh, Europe or Asia or uh, the New World, that is uh, Americas, both South America and uh, North America. So here, <clears throat> as uh, you may be knowing, these uh, deadly diseases did not remain confined to one single area and become endemic. And when a disease breaks out in a particular area and keeps uh, you know, occurring there, for a very long time and if the features remain very specific to that particular area then the disease is called endemic to that particular area and when that kind of disease actually breaks out in a particular in a different area in a small manner well it is called outbreak and outbreaks keeps increasing the number of you know affected people and then it becomes, uh, you know, epidemic and it goes out of the border of the region, becomes, um, you know, you know, widespread in a nation, in a nation and it becomes epidemic and then it crosses the borders of the nation and becomes international. So therefore, when we use these words, we will have to be very careful. But if for, for a common man, these words do not make much difference since all these words are you know, related to the diseases which are deadly, which are infectious, which are contagious, etc., etc. Well, as we know, as far as the world is concerned, you know, many historians say that the diseases actually kept occurring with the growth of human civilization. Therefore, the diseases are as old as human civilizations. And as the civilization moved on, the diseases also kept moving and most of the time they checkmated the progress of the civilization but one interesting thing is that whenever deadly diseases broke out in any corner of the world whether it is in europe or in africa or in america or in india or in china well the people you know faced the challenge faced it very effectively and uh, you know moved on 
and the civilization continue to exist and in no um, country or in no continent we find the civilization being destroyed by deadly diseases but anyway these diseases you know caused immense you know uh, damage to the people to the society to the political structure to the economic activities etc etc and uh, many a time you know the civilization became stagnant for some time for example in 541 uh, ad a plague broke, broke out in roman empire and it caused a lot of destruction and it is called the plague of justinian and it was uh, transmitted from north africa and after about eight, 800 years gap well this uh, um, plague again came back to europe through italy and it created a lot of problem and it is called the black death and the black death or what's called this plague entered europe through italy italian ports and um, which killed a large number of people as you know some historians say it killed nearly you know five crore people at that time and it was at that time that the roman empire actually took action uh, you know to to segregate people to isolate people to keep people in the quarantine and all and uh, whenever the ships actually brought sailors from different parts of the Mediterranean world, well, they were actually, you know, kept uh, in a distance in the sea and they were quarantined. And there, the soldiers or the um, um, uh, traders were isolated for 30 days in the beginning. It was called Trentino. And then when the diseases or the intensity of disease did not, you know, reduce, well, the the um, uh, period of uh, seclusion or isolation was extended by 10 more days that is for 40 days and it was called quarantino in italy so the black death which actually occurred in the europe in the uh, uh, between uh, 1347 and 50 well killed a large number of uh, you know population in europe it affected india also it affected china also and it affected some some extent um, um, Africa, and as far as India is concerned, uh, we do not come across you know records to find out what kind of uh, um, impact this particular Black Death had, whether it was as serious as it was in Europe. And some historians say that in the records of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, we find a reference to that, and it affected Delhi to some extent. But then India recovered from that shock. So that was the first occurrence, or the uh, first what say uh, mentioning of any deadly diseases in India in Indian records. And then this uh, <clears throat> deadly plague, um, you know, kept visiting uh, the world, especially the European world and london suffered a lot and it is said that the um, london plague back in uh, 2000 i'm sorry uh, in in the 17th century that is to say exactly 1665 um, a deadly uh, plague disease broke out in london which actually destroyed more than 20 percent of the london population and in fact it is said that from 14th century to 17th century london was visited by during the period of nearly 300 years, about 40 uh, plagues, and uh, this plague, you know, you know, affected the fortunes of the London people to a very, very great extent. Then we come across, you know, uh, smallpox affecting affecting the New World, as all of you may, may know. After the discovery of Americas, a large number of uh, Europeans actually went to America. And when they went to America, well, they carried the germs of um, smallpox and smallpox, which was unknown to America, you know, started spreading and it be became an epidemic. And it is said that more than 90 to 95 percent of the American Indians smallpox. It did not affect the whites from Europe much because they had already developed immunity in Europe since Europe was visited by smallpox as well as plague regularly. But as far as America was concerned, it was a new disease and therefore the the plague, the, 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 the bacillus, what you say, uh, you know, destroyed the American uh, population to a very, very great extent and America took a very long time to recover from uh, that shock. And then we come across what's called the deadly cholera uh, disease, uh, you know, breaking out in some parts of uh, 
um, you know uh, india and also in england and england and then we come across another great uh, deadly disease bubonic plague in the form of 1890s uh, i mean the form of uh, you know bubonic plague which affected india in the 1890s and in the first decade of the 20th century and therefore what we see is that human civilization was not immune uh, from these deadly diseases and these deadly diseases kept occurring because of so many factors and during the time of black death in the 14th century the roman government came to the conclusion that uh, seclusion physical segregation isolation and quarantining of uh, people etc etc was very much needed gardening of the areas which were affected by these uh, diseases was also very essential and therefore this quarantine or what we say are 10 trentinos or 30 days isolation or 40 days isolation gardening of the villages isolation of villages etc 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 uh, had a history of about this, uh, say uh, 600 years we can say with this let us now take up the um, you know the experience of india so here we are focusing more on the colonial experience because as we see in history books um, scholarly writings that uh, have come out on various uh, you know, diseases uh, during the colonial period and at the same time on public health policies issues etc etc we um, you know uh, find that uh, most of these diseases actually occurred in india during the colonial period so during the pre-colonial period uh, we do not exactly know whether these diseases had any deadly impact as we find today the pandemic is actually doing um, well the indian historians <clears throat> recorded almost everything whatever actually affected the civilization of society in a big way uh, those things have been recorded very uh, systematically uh, in the middle ages especially by the uh, muslim chroniclers and uh, as far as these diseases are concerned we do not come across uh, uh, any mentioning of that and therefore we can definitely say that uh, the, uh, no, you know these uh, infectious diseases which actually affected the uh, other parts of the world were absent in india though they occurred in a small way they did not catch the attention of uh, uh, what's called the chroniclers of that period and then as far as uh, colonialism is concerned now we shall uh, deal with the british uh, policies and um, as far as history students are concerned they should know that um, uh, about health issues about uh, epidemics about tropical diseases about colonial medicine science and technology etc etc uh, for a very long time no scholar actually focused uh, uh, and wrote on different issues pertaining to these things and um, in the post independence era uh, what we see is that a large number of scholars, whether from uh, Britain or America or from other universities of uh, Europe and also in, from Indian universities actually focused on the health issues during the colonial period. And uh, <clears throat> the study of colonial um, uh, health history or the colonial medicine or tropical diseases, etc., etc., became a favorite subject of uh, a large number of scholars and of course i am not going to deal with the historiography since it is very very lengthy and this historiography on science and medicine on uh, health issues etc etc in the colonial period focus on different issues which i will um, brief uh, you people in a very uh, um, you know minute manner and um, as far as health issues are concerned um, we know that the British and the other Europeans started coming to India in the uh, 16th century and um, from 17th century they started coming in a large number to India and they settled down in different parts of uh, India etc etc et et and uh, Mark Harrison one of the historians actually focus on the in the in, uh, you know the settlement of the British and their health policies and Puram Bala actually writes about uh, the uh, impact of uh, colonial medicine and uh, colonial health policies in Bengal. And uh, Nudula Raman actually focuses on Bombay and uh, talks about uh, how the British actually dealt with the deadly plague that broke out uh, in the 1890s and other things. And then Vishwamai Pati, uh, David Arnold. David Arnold, in fact, actually wrote about 
how the british actually colonized the indian uh, bodies in, through medical intervention and in the same way <coughs> you have iraq line who actually spoke about the colonial policies towards the um, diseases and to what extent the british were sincere in uh, applying their mind uh, to you know, to to uh, erase or wipe out these diseases in india and uh, you know uh, other historians have also focused on, the, on these issues and uh, as far as india is concerned chitabata palit has written about bengal and how bengal affected uh, bengal was affected by malaria and what kind of um, uh, actions actually the british uh, uh, took and also um, so some historians like um, uh, anil kumar you know who actually wrote about uh, medicine and the raj british raj you know spoke folk, uh, focuses on diseases and medical research in india so what is interesting to note is that whenever uh, you know diseases broke out whether it is influenza or plague or cholera or malaria or smallpox or uh, typhoid or tuberculosis or any other diseases well to what extent the british were you know interested in uh, inventing medicine for uh, the, these uh, um, uh, you know no diseases and um, to what extent they actually you know fostered medical research in india to what extent they actually supported the scientists like ronald ross or robert koch or uh, uh, other people R ronald ross as you may know uh, worked on malaria um, to find out you know what caused malaria and finally he found that uh, the mosquitoes uh, you know actually uh, you know were the reasons for the spread of uh, uh, malaria and he issued nobel prize nobel prize for that in the year 1902 and he was a product of Indian medical service, you can say, but he was treated very shabbily and he was not supported by the British. So, to what extent the British were serious in supporting the medical uh, research as far as the diseases are concerned, whether uh, they, you know, wanted to put an end to these medical, um, sorry, the, these medical problems or uh, these challenges once for all by inventing um, what's called medicines, etc., etc. Well, uh, when we speak about the British administration, uh, uh, what you come across is that everywhere, you know, the British actually showed a kind of paternalistic attitude. They posed uh, their empire as a paternalistic Raj. Paternalistic is a Raj in the sense they wanted to treat Indians as their children and um, they wanted to ensure that uh, you know, you know the Indians uh, lived peacefully and happily and healthily under the regime, and it was their claim. And therefore, they came to India, um, proclaiming what is called the civilization, you know, civilizing mission in India. So they wanted to establish peace here, not only establishing peace here, but also ensure you know public health and also well-being of the Indian people. And to what extent they actually succeeded in doing that? And uh, many historians actually ask one question, whether the British actually used medical intervention and their medicines and their what's called knowledge about India as far as uh, diseases are concerned to, to control India and control Indian people, whether medicine was used as a tool to control the empire, to control the, and to maintain the empire and also to control the uh, people. So there are a large number of uh, historians who actually you know look at the british medical missions as an as a as a tool to control the empire or to maintain the empire by subduing the indians and by establishing the um, uh, superiority of the uh, what's called um, uh, medicines uh, of the of the of the british uh, empire well here one thing that we have to bear in mind is that the british after coming to india <coughs> established their settlements in different parts of India, whether it is in Bengal or Madras or Bombay and other areas. And when the British actually came here as traders, the soldiers also came with them uh, to, to what's called uh, give protection to the settlements. And along with them, we also see medical teams coming to India. We see you know, surgeon naturalists, we see, you know, doctors coming to India. So these surgeon naturalists, as well as, um, you know, adventure doctors, 
and the travelers who actually came to the colonies, especially to India, studied the Indian conditions. And uh, when they saw people suffering from various diseases, and also when they saw the, the impenetrable, uh, inhospitable forests and the environment, etc., etc., they concluded that, uh, you know, this colony uh, is infested with uh, incurable, incurable diseases. So they produced knowledge about Indian, uh, what's called diseases. They produced information and knowledge about the land and the people and the environment. And they also created, you know, impressions about uh, what's called uh, the colonial, I'm sorry, the, the tropical diseases uh, that existed in India. So when I say tropical diseases, as you know, India is situated in the tropical region between the, as you know, Capricorn and uh, uh, Cancer, uh, this one, tropics. And uh, these diseases, British actually said that they were unknown to, and they were unknown. So they, they, these diseases were unknown to the British, and therefore they created an impression that the tropical diseases were deadly diseases, and therefore they wanted to, um, you know, um, find out medicines for that and uh, what's called cure them, and also establish control over the people through medical means. So this is one of the main agendas, in the sense that the the um, medicine. Colonial medicine, what they said, became a tool of empire. And Daniel Hedrick, one of the historians who actually wrote about the way how the British actually made their way into various colonies in the world, speaks about the tools of empire. How, you know, some of the, uh, you know, technology, some of the, uh, you know, medicines became tool of the empire. He talks about new technologies which actually uh, created new ideology among the British, uh, new ideologies of imperialism among the British and the Europeans, and how did they use this new ideology and new technology to penetrate deep into the African uh, states as well as South American states, etc., etc., and also uh, into in Asian countries. So he says that the, 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 the British actually focused on developing technology, uh, and with the help of iron, they produced and also good uh, technology they produced uh, what's called guns superior guns and field guns and all and also with the help of uh, you know steam uh, they produced steam ships and also he said that uh, with the, the, the invented medicine in the form of quinine to deal with the malaria because most of the colonies actually was known for malaria and malaria, malarial disease was not very well known to the um, Europeans and they used to lose people or uh, used to uh, what's called uh, find that a number of soldiers actually uh, you know dying because of malaria in Africa and Asia. So uh, they invented quinine and with the help of gun, with the help of steamboat, with the help of uh, what's called quinine, they penetrated deep into the uh, colonies. So what we find is that the British actually made use of technology made use of uh, uh, medicine, made use of uh, uh, steamships to penetrate deep into the state. So these things became tools of, uh, tools of conquest, tools of penetration also. So uh, whether we accept the, um, you know, uh, exaggerated version of uh, Daniel Edric or not, but he focuses on the role of medicine, how medicine actually, you know, contributed immensely uh, uh, for the colonizing of uh, some of the states uh, in Asia, in Africa, and in uh, in South America. And, and as we have seen, they had already uh, colonized the United States of America by 17th century, but in the 18th and in 19th century, new imperialism, you know, uh, began to um, get uh, uh, a big, uh, you know, boost because of uh, new technology and um, which became a, a what's called tool of uh, penetration and conquest. So with uh, this, we, let us now focus on the British uh, attitude towards the Indian disease. Here I'm not going to again deal with a number of diseases here because during the uh, British period, we come across uh, uh, smallpox, we come across malaria, we come across uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, cholera and 
another deadly disease, the plague, and of course it was the bubonic plague. And as far as plague is concerned, historians say that uh, and, you know there were three types of uh, plagues, and this bubonic plague, uh, more than other plagues like uh, uh, pneumonic plague and all, affected the uh, Indi Indians. Why did the, uh, you know these things actually uh, you know um, break out in India? Are why they used to be breaking out regularly, uh, you know, you know, uh, in India. Whether colonial rule was responsible for that, or whether Indian conditions were responsible for that, and again, scholars are um, here uh, in a, in a uh, dilemma as to uh, who was to find out who was responsible for it. For example. Uh, many of the English historians uh, do not want to blame the British government. They, in fact, say that the British medical intervention to a very, very great extent, uh, you know, helped Indians. Helped Indians. It actually removed the unhygienic, you know, you know, environment that prevailed in India and made the living of the people, uh, you know, healthy and uh, peaceful. And some historians uh, from uh, India and other, uh, you know, third world countries say that. You know, the British actually used medicine and other things to keep the colony under permanent subjugation, under permanent subjugation, because uh, they destroyed the indigenous medicine. As far as India is concerned, if you uh, uh, make a reference to the Indian uh, medicine, well, Ayurveda, uh, Unani Tib, or Siddha, or other medicines were very much prevalent in India, and for centuries together, Indians were depending on these medicines. But after the coming of the British in the 16th century um, onward, what kind of uh, you know you know treatment uh, you know they received at the hands of the British? That is very interesting. And Vishwamitra and uh, Mark Addison and the other people actually you find uh, uh, you know trace various stages uh, in the interaction between. Um, Western medicine or allopathic medicine and Indian indigenous medicine. They say that in the beginning, both really what happened was that the Western medicine began to uh, assert its superiority because the Western medicine began to show its efficacy uh, as a preventive medicine, as a curative medicine. It began to show its efficacy, and this um, uh, what's called uh, effectiveness of uh, the uh, Western medicine, you know, started, uh, you know, influencing the uh, popularity of Indian medicine and Indian medicine was uh, gradually relegated to the uh, background. And uh, from the 18th century onwards, when the diseases started spreading, well, the Western medicine asserted its superiority. And the British said that um, as <coughs> their, uh, in the same way as their policies uh, were, uh, uh, you know, bringing about the well-being of the Indians in the form of uh, uh, what's called uh, establishment of peace in India in the form of, uh, um, you know, flourishing uh, trade and commerce and internal trade in the form of creation of wealth, etc., etc., and also introduction of Western education, etc., etc. Uh, their medicine is also having a good impact on India. And they used to refer to the population figures. Uh, you know, census was used as a, an indicator to um, uh, trust the importance of Western medicine because they said that the population growth is you know, started increasing. They began to stress the point that population growth, uh, you know, uh, is taking place in a very big way, and the mortality rate and morbidity is also coming down in India, and it is all because of uh, what's called the British uh, uh, civilizing mission, which they uh, um, were introducing in India in a systematic manner. Well, now, as far as diseases are concerned, I will be focusing more on in the plague um, in the beginning itself when, uh, um, you know, the Professor Satish Kumar Shetty made a mention uh, of a plague which actually affected India in a big way. Of course, um, whether it's malaria or cholera or um, the smallpox, they also affected Indians very much. Uh, for example, smallpox was there in India, in Bengal and other areas. And in fact, uh, people actually uh, worshipped the uh, god of uh, smallpox as uh, Sitala or Mariamma. Uh, and uh, every god, uh, every disease was uh, given the name of a god in India. And um, well, uh, this uh, smallpox was considered as uh, one of the uh, diseases uh, which actually affected Indians and the Indians, especially the people who were living in uh, rural areas, uh, considered the spread of disease as a, as a curse of God, and they 
try to propitiate the god that is Sitara or uh, Mariamma. Uh, in South India, it was Mariamma. In North India, it was Sitara. And the British, um, of course, in the beginning were not uh, um, in a, a position to focus on that because as colonialism actually you know, grew in India, uh, as the British focused more and more on the annexation and the conquest and annexation, um, well, in the beginning, they were bothered only about the health of the, their soldiers and uh, European civilians and also bureaucrats, and they were not bothered about the uh, Indians. So uh, their response was very lukewarm and, they were, um, and, and the lack of medicine were affected uh, the, the Indians. And as we know, um, the Indians actually practiced variolations using the variola uh, or the, the material of the smallpox source and uh, scratched it on the arm of the, um, you know, uh, of, of the affected person or the infected person. And uh, through that, they used to cure uh, the disease. So variolation was very much uh, uh, popular in India and it was also popular in China and other areas. And as all of us know, Edward Jenner, one of the English uh, um, scientists and uh, doctors, you know, gradually produced a vaccine for that by using uh, uh, what's called uh, cowpox and later on he produced a vaccine and this Jennerian uh, you know, medicine uh, became popular. But in, in India, the British were not sincere in, uh, in applying this uh, medicine or vaccination or taking a mass vaccination of the rural people because uh, they were focused more on the on Europeans only. Up to 1857, we do not come across any serious attempt on the part of the British because um, uh, they were focused on what's called the health of the soldiers. Because the, the uh, British army constituted their you know you know um, you know for source of strength, and any weakening of uh, the army would uh, spell doom on the. Uh, uh, what's called the future of the empire and therefore they uh, very uh, systematically uh, you know uh, isolated the um, locations of uh, the soldiers or residential areas of Europeans um, and uh, from the um, areas of uh, uh, Indians and uh, protect, protect them in a very systematic manner in the sense that they introduced uh, sanitation there they introduced piped water there, they introduced the clean water there, they took care to test the people. And for example, the uh, European soldiers were not allowed to mingle with the Indian women. But when the soldiers, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, wanted to go back because of uh, their battleship, uh, well, the, Indian, the British government permitted the creation of law hospitals within the um, vicinity of the barracks and also European residential areas where Indian women were allowed to stay uh, just for the physical pleasure of the uh, European soldiers. And most of the European soldiers, as some British historians say, hailed from uh, uh, lower rank of their society and therefore they were not in a position to marry and maintain a family there. And therefore they were allowed to mingle, mingle with the, uh, the Indian women. And whenever an Indian woman was uh, found, uh, you know, infected with the diseases, uh, uh, she was sent out of the lock hospitals uh, um, permanently. So this was the condition, um, you know, that uh, existed there as far as barracks were concerned. As far as higher authorities are concerned, generals and others, they were allowed to marry and um, uh, settle down in India. And they were not allowed to, uh, they were actually banned from, you know, having contact with the Indian women because the British thought that the officers and the civilian uh, officers, the ICS officers and all, constituted the, the symbol of honor of the British uh, Empire and also Han uh, uh, strength. So uh, the British actually focused more on the so soldiers. They neglected the bazaars, they neglected the marketplaces, they neglected the uh, port cities, they neglected uh, uh, what's called the places of pilgrimage, etc. Et and because of this, what happened was that the, the, the uh, diseases started spreading in a very, very virulent way. The British took uh, you know, a very serious view of the uh, pilgrimage centers, especially Haridwar or um, other things. And they uh, instructed the municipalities or the local governments to take action uh, to maintain sanitation there. But 
for them india was a land of diseases it was the a place where many diseases actually emerged and it was the impression they created in the all over the world you know, uh, because you know the these tropical you know uh, diseases were very much peculiar to uh, the tropics only and the british pretended that they never experienced uh, you know these diseases in uh, europe but some historians say that uh, this uh, uh, tropicality of tropical disease is a myth because even europeans you know experienced the smallpox experienced uh, malaria experienced the plague and cholera um, um, and in their countries and uh, there was nothing very special about uh, the tropical diseases uh, as far as uh, uh, you know, tropical countries were concerned but anyway the british focused more on this thing and uh, one important uh, development that we see is that more than um, you know 40% of uh, soldiers uh, you know died because of fevers in india and um, uh, it is said that uh, <coughs> as far as uh, wars were concerned uh, only 6% of the total strength of the british army you know died in the war and most of them uh, you know died because of uh, what's called diseases it may be a fever it may be uh, typhoid it may be diarrhea it may be dysentery it may be cholera etc etc so the rate of death on the part of the um, uh, on the, the european soldiers was increasing and that actually sent an alarm uh, to the british to focus more on sanitation to focus on uh, what's called maintenance of cleanliness uh, in uh, many places where indians actually lived whether it is in uh, urban areas or whether semi urban or rural areas or uh, uh, you know you know market places or bazaars etc etc because the dirt the filth and uh, other things which were stored they uh, you know created problem for the uh, british and it is said that uh, at that time uh, many theories were actually uh, very much uh, uh, in vogue among the british one is that uh, these diseases especially cholera and malaria uh, you know water borne diseases so the theory of water borne diseases became very popular in the sense that you know clogged waters actually became a breeding ground uh, for diseases so if you ensure proper you know ensure clean water if you actually uh, took care of um, surface water as well as grain uh, ground ground water and also in the supply of this water uh, this water to various supporters of the british uh, soldiers well this this is to be curbed and also um, you know you know um uh, asking the municipalities to take up uh, these issues uh, in their towns and uh, you know um, focusing on the clean uh, clean water supply and another theory was that uh, that is aerial miasmatic theory which actually uh, became very popular in the later stages it was popular in europe also aerial miasma miasma is uh, an unpleasant smell of uh, rotting uh, uh, materials rotting material it may be in carcasses or any other things or human excreta or um, dead uh, animals rotting etc etc so when the wind actually passes through this uh, uh, on a filth it carries miasma or uh, bad smell and it spreads actually what's called uh, uh, diseases so it carries the germ or the virus or bacteria Uh, and and it affects the people and the soldiers and all therefore the british actually took care to um, segregate the soldiers uh, from the bazaar area or from the human uh, habitations because the indians were considered as unclean very filthy and um, people who lacked you know any sanitary consciousness and who actually focused and maintained very poor sanitary conditions etc etc and therefore what they did was that they took care to keep the barracks away from the uh, town areas or indian uh, habitation centers so the uh, miasma theory was also very popular at that time but these theories were not accepted by um, um, later uh, scientists and uh, um, they began to focus more on on the ident- uh, on identifying the real cause of uh, what's called the disease of the smallpox or cholera or uh, malaria etc etc even plague also so now let us uh, take up uh, the uh, you know plague disease actually which affected uh, uh, india uh, in the year 1895 96 and uh, 
for about uh, seven years or eight years, this deadly disease destroyed millions of people in India. And how did it actually happen? And what was the response of the British? So I am curtailing the details to a very great extent because it's a very, very vast uh, topic. Well, as far as the plague is concerned, we know that the plague was uh, um, very much uh, uh, you know, uh, known to the European children. existence from this earth but they could not do it and as far as smallpox is concerned you may know that uh, Jenner's uh, you know vaccine uh, later on improved to a very great extent and of course in a small way and in an isolated and scattered manner smallpox existed in different parts of the world by 1980 the World Health Organization in, you know, could uh, uh, announce that uh, the smallpox disease has been completely wiped out of uh, uh, the earth. So this was a great uh, uh, contribution uh, made by the uh, doctors and scientists who worked tirelessly um, to destroy this uh, disease. And as far as the plague is concerned, this is another important disease and the British actually feared this uh, very much. In 19, it is said that plague was uh, um, not uh, known to India in the same way as it was known uh, for the Europeans in the, in, um, in uh, Europe. And uh, plague actually uh, affected regularly uh, the Indians because as we know that uh, you know, the, the rat flea, uh, fleas um, you know, uh, were responsible for the spread of that. But to find out that it was a rat flea which was responsible for the uh, spread of uh, uh, plague disease, it took a very, very, very long time. And here, what is interesting to note is that in the year 1897, 96-97, when the uh, plague broke out, well, Indians were taken by surprise. Up to 1895, you know, uh, it is said that the Indians were not affected the plague to a very great extent, though in the 1820s, in the 30s and 40s, uh, in uh, in some areas, whether it is in Punjab or northwestern province that is present day Uttar Pradesh or uh, in the northwestern province, the present day Pakistan area or uh, in uh, some portion of Bangladesh, the present day, uh, at that time it was Bangla. So th this was there, well, it, it did not attract the attention because the severity uh, the virulence of this disease was not so much. But it affected in the year 1895, you know, you know very, to a very, very great extent. It affected Bombay, it affected Bengal, it affected the Northwestern Province, it affected Kashmir, it affected uh, United Province, the present Uttar Pradesh and Punjab. And hundreds of thousands of people actually died. But the Indian Play Commission, which was uh, appointed in the year 1898 says that only 3% of people um, of Bombay died because of plague. They wanted to minimize the impact of uh, the plague. And uh, what is interesting to note is that uh, since, uh, and many strands say that the plague was unknown to India for a very long time because they give some reasons. One is that uh, as far as India is concerned, the plague never uh, was not been identified with any god uh, um, um, uh, in any part of uh, uh, India. For example, smallpox uh, is uh, identified with the Sitara or Maryam and um, uh, cholera is um, associated with uh, what is called Mahamari and uh, some gods. Uh, in Bengal, nine deities were associated with nine diseases. But as far as plague is concerned, um, David Arnold and other people say that it, and also Anil Kumar say that uh, it was not uh, identified within God and there was no, uh, no procedure of uh, propitiating God to, uh, you know, protect them from plague and all. And uh, therefore, uh, they say that it was not very popular, not very much in existence in, 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 in India um, before 1890. And they also say that uh, 
this plague actually most of the time came from the foothills of the Himalayas, which was very close to the Yunnan province of China. And the Yunnan province of China, you know, was affected by plague during that period. And, you know, the traders and others actually um, carried the uh, virus with them and they came to the Kumon region and Karwal region of the, which actually uh, situated at the foothills of the Himalayas. And from there, it actually went to um, the Middle East, it went to Punjab, it went to uh, you know, Bengal into Punjab, I'm sorry, Bombay, and became very, very uh, virulent. So, in this way, um, uh, Indian historians try to say that this disease was not uh, very much, uh, you know, you know, present in India before 1890s. And they also say that the 1896 and 97 plague affected India virulently because the Indians were not exposed this uh, disease previously and therefore they had not developed the immunity for this uh, immunity for this particular disease whereas for smallpox for cholera for malaria indians had already developed the immunity and that is what uh, you know historians say when the smallpox actually affected the americans the new world well a large number of um, the native americans were killed by that they were decimated as a as a population they were completely destroyed uh, from 90 to 95 percent of the uh, you know indigenous population was wiped out whereas europeans were not affected by this because uh, since uh, you know smallpox used to occur in europe they had already developed uh, some kind of immunity historic uh, you know immunity uh, uh, which actually protected them and as far as india was concerned um, when the plague came indians became easy easy victims because it was a new disease and um, it is said that um, they were not uh, exposed to the uh, micro parasites of uh, uh, plague bacillus and uh, uh, it actually killed them in millions. So this is one of the theories they uh, you know, put uh, uh, forward to say that the plague affected India more severely virulently because Indians were getting exposed for the first time to this kind of disease. And within a matter of two decades, 20 years from 1896 to um, 15, 1915, well, more than 20 million people actually were killed by this deadly disease. So it explains to a great um, you know, detail uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the destruction it actually caused. One more thing is that um, conversely, whereas Indians died in a large number, as far as Europeans were concerned, you do not find much death among the uh, Europeans, much mortality. Among the Europeans, because they had already, you know, you know, uh, developed a kind of uh, uh, what called immunity for that. And um, what the British did was that when the plague actually broke out in India in it, they began to act in a very, in in a furic manner. There was a flurry of activities because they thought that if the plague is allowed to, uh, you know, spread, it will destroy the uh, the empire. It will destroy the empire not just by causing damage to the soldiers or European people, but by causing damage to international trade. And therefore, what they did was that they gave the policy of laser fire. You know, the policy of laser fire, the Europeans actually followed for a very long time, especially the British, to protect their trade interests in India. The non-intervention in, 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 in um, what's called trade activities, it was given up. Now, they uh, argued for you know you know very active state interventionism in order to protect uh, the empire so this uh, thorough interventionism uh, you know was uh, advocated uh, in order to what's called control the disease and also control the people and also save the empire save the empire so this is one uh, this is being cited by some historians to say that uh, um, to say that the plague was not new to uh, india now a kind of a fear psychosis gripped the minds of the Europeans when this disease actually broke out. And at the same time, uh, what we see is that um, plague was affected by the uh, affected the Indians in, a, in in many ways because we, they had no uh, immunity. They had no immunity because of poverty, and there was you know you know people were already you know suffering from other diseases also. 
and there were famines and india was visited by a large number of famines during the british period we must remember that and as late as 1942 43 there was a deadly uh, famine uh, you know in bengal and it was a man made uh, famine it was a humanly created famine because winston churchill the prime minister of england you know you know you know, you know uh, drained the uh, indian uh, grain for war efforts in Europe and therefore there was artificial scarcity of uh, what's called grains and Indian people suffered, died in millions. So in the same way here, uh, this, um, uh, these, this uh, because famine affected people did not have um, proper uh, nutrition and malnutrition, you know, killed um, you know, a large number of people and uh, this disease became deadly. So and Anil Kumar says that, you know, this uh, uh, the British now acted in a very, um, what you say, harsh and barbaric manner because they wanted to confine this plague you know, to India only. They wanted to see that this disease did not cross the borders of India because there was already an international uh, UN cry about the plague. Some, you know, French government, for example, thought, said that, you know, the British were rulers of the home of, uh, you know, you know, cholera. Now it has become the rulers of the home of uh, plague also, and it condemned the British for not taking proper, uh, you know, measures for sanitation, for high, for the maintenance of uh, sanitation, hygiene, cleanliness in India, and because of that, the disease is spreading. So no nation in Europe was showing any humanitarian consideration, but they were actually, um, you know, you know, uh, greatly alarmed by the. Um, what's called prospects of the decline of what's called trade and commerce. The British also was greatly uh, alerted by this because they wanted to preserve their international trade or commerce and also internal trade. And at the same time, they wanted to protect the empire intact. And uh, they also wanted to see that the other nations like Russia or France or other European countries or Americans did not close their ports for Indian goods and all. Um, uh, so, what the British did was that they decided to, you know, introduce very stern measures to contain uh, plague. And what is interesting uh, to note is that the British medicines completely failed here. The British wanted to create an impression that, uh, uh, you know, their uh, medicines are very effective, very, uh, what's called, uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, capable of uh, uh, destroying any diseases, tropical diseases in, in, in India. And but here, the British medicine you know, stood exposed. Their superiority stood exposed. They could not contain the spread of uh, this uh, particular disease. And there was a fear psychosis. There was international criticism. From everywhere, the Brit British were criticized uh, for not uh, taking action to prevent the spread of this. Europeans were now. Uh, you know, you know, began to suffer from a kind of seized mentality. They wanted to close the ports for British goods and uh, and ships. So now, what the British did was that they, um, you know, took um, action to prevent the uh, spread of this. And uh, they used in the beginning in Bombay, the Bombay Municipality Act, which actually gave some power to the uh, civil administrator to, uh, to take action. Uh, that was uh, that act was uh, enacted in the year 1888. But uh, after some time, they found that uh, this act was, uh, you, know, you know, ineffective. And therefore, what they did was that they enacted one more act called the, the Epidemic Diseases Act of uh, uh, 19, um, uh, yeah, 1897. And this was a deadly act. And this was, you know, made uh, uh, applicable at, uh, you, know, you know, throughout India. It was, it had all India, uh, you know, application and um, deadly very cruel and inhuman condi what's called classes were uh, incorporated in that and no uh, it was passed in a hurry without giving any scope for discussion on the, uh, on, the on, on the terms and conditions that should be on the classes that should be you know incorporated in the act and now uh, i will uh, be very brief now uh, well as far as this um, uh, particular disease is concerned as I already told you, the British thought that their medical mission is failing. And um, they thought that the, their doctors, <coughs> their what's called men in the Indian Medical Service, IMS, 
who are not capable of containing this uh, to implement the uh, rules and regulations um, you know you know um, uh, incorporated in the act and therefore what they did was that they gave power to the indian civil servants ics bureaucracy and also the army so the service of army and other you know bureaucracy was taken and uh, medical uh, service was placed uh, under their control and um, in bombay in calcutta in pune in the other areas black commissioners were appointed and they were given immense uh, power to take action to contain uh, this particular disease and i need not uh, you know go uh, into the details of uh, the actions they used to take and it gave power to segregate the people to isolate the people to quarantine quarantine people in a large number mercilessly without any reference to their caste creed or religious sensibilities sensibilities they did not even care for the honor of women even in the um, uh, public road they would uh, you know you know investigate uh, women uh, and children mercilessly they would beat up the people if anybody protested they destroyed villages after villages after quarantining them and this actually sent shock waves among the indians so the, the though the british had already you know had been telling that they were here for the welfare of the people they were here to create a welfare state and they were you know exhibiting paternalistic attitude the other side of the british you know you know uh, you know attitude was uh, uh, in full exhibition as, uh, when it came to the implementation of uh, epidemic disease act and uh, uh, as you know this actually caused a lot of heartburn among the indians and uh, to to read out the statement made by uh, tilak um, uh, you can definitely see what tilak i'm saying you, you, you can uh, definitely gauge the tension that the indians had Uh, when you refer to tilak statement plague is more merciful to the uh, to us than its human prototypes now ravaging the city the tyranny uh, of the plague uh, committee and its chosen instruments is too is at to too brutal to uh, all uh, respectable people to treat us at ease so that means uh, here the it is becoming more cruel and cruel the british actually showing a lot of reality and uh, the calcutta municipal commissioner n mukherjee made a statement and he warned the the calcutta play commissioner by name harvard risley uh, that the people would prefer to die of uh, the plague rather than consent or uh, submit to the removal of their mothers wives daughters and sisters to hospitals so people would die instead of you know becoming you know uh, subject to this kind of in, uh, humiliation so the british did not care for any of these criticism because their idea was to, to protect the empire they wanted to protect the the um, you know commercial fortunes of their empire they wanted to see that uh, this disease is isolated to uh, india only confined to india only and their empire uh, remained intact at one point of time some historians say that the british even you know feared about the uh, exist you know, you know about the continuation of the empire in india the illusion of permanence you know after 1857 um, uh, revolt the british re established their control and they thought that their uh, empire would remain on a permanent basis but this, this particular disease created such impression that uh, uh, you know you know the british at one point of time thought that the empire, they would lose the empire they would lose the battle to uh, on the play so this is the problem and anyway uh, this plague gradually you know subsided uh, the british introduced a large number of plans the quarantine became uh, you know you know a regular uh, feature gardening of became a regular feature and uh, the the soldiers you know you know raided the houses of the people to find out whether affected people were there and it it created a you know you know scene of a war it seems uh because soldiers coming in a large number gardening up the house and searching and taking people forcibly and setting fire to villages etc etc which actually made you know till to say that uh, the plague was more merciful to us than the british soldiers so this is the thing that we uh, come across here and uh, uh, what I, i will conclude in 5 minutes so uh, if you see 
uh, the measures taken by the British, uh, one can definitely say that the, that in the whole of 19th century, the British were not uh, very sincere in dealing with the uh, with the you know, what called uh, situation, you know, you know, which would ensure uh, or which would prevent uh, the uh, which would ensure uh, that the reoccurrence of uh, these diseases would not take place. So here, the British. You know, though claimed uh, that they were here in India for the welfare of the people, well, their attitude as far as the diseases were concerned, uh, you know, was utterly uh, what's called uh, revolting, we can say. And the Indians were very, very angry. And um, as you know, many of these students may be knowing that the way they dealt with the Indians, the cruelty that they exhibited, and the lack of uh, what you say. Uh, facilities, uh, you know, for the people to uh, deal with the situation, etc., etc., angered the youngsters, and especially two uh, brothers, Chapekar brothers, who actually, uh, you, know, you know, assassinated the play commissioner, uh, you know, W.C. Rand uh, in Pune. So that is an indication of uh, the anger that uh, the people were, uh, you know, you know, exhibiting at that time. So this is a very, very uh, what you say, disturbing development for the British. And um, in 1902, this plague affected Punjab also, but gradually the plague commission, which was appointed in the year uh, 1898, gave a report and it uh, actually suggested the uh, repealing of some of the deadly classes from the Epidemic Act. Uh, this is a fact, it, they, they were removed in 1901, it seems. And then the plague continued here and there for a long time, but the attitude of the British, their ambivalence, their uh, dilly dallying ta tactics, their uh, what's called uh, uh, the lack of serious, seriousness on their part, you know, you know, created an impression among the Indians that colonialism uh, is not good, uh, uh, not good, and colonialism is very much a hazard. One historian, for example, by name uh, uh, Daniel Doon, actually says uh, says that colonialism is a health hazard. So the British attitude very clearly proved that the colonialism was a health hazard. And the next thing that we come across is uh, the famous uh, or infamous, we can say, 18, I'm sorry, 1918, 1920 uh, Spanish flu. And as you know, Spanish flu also occurred uh, throughout the world. And here, as far as India is concerned, it caused the immense destruction. And uh, as far as the source of this disease is concerned, it is said that after the First World War, the soldiers who were uh, returning uh, to India from Europe actually brought the uh, virus to India um, and uh, uh, spread it. And it spread so fast that uh, India lost uh, nearly 12 million uh, people. And um, according to David Arnold, more than 12 million people died. That means 5% of uh, India's population died because of this uh, Spanish flu. Spanish flu, in the sense, it was influenza. And since the Spain Spaniards for the first time announced it, it was called the Spanish flu. And uh, if you uh, look at the population report, well, you see that uh, 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 census report, you see that there was a, a decline in the population growth in the decline because a huge number of uh, youths actually died during that period. So then, um, during the colonial period, the British, uh, during the rest of the period, after uh, 1900, they did not show much zeal uh, in, 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 in uh, um, what's called uh, taking up uh, medical research to find out medicines for various diseases. And their, uh, the, the tempo which they showed in the beginning was lost and the medical research was not given much support by the British in terms of um, uh, you know, funding and all those things. So when in 1947 India became independent, uh, well, India was a very poor country, uh, not only in terms of uh, economic uh, what's called wealth, but also in terms of uh, um, health and well-being because lack of hospitals, lack of facilities, lack of uh, uh, what's called um, uh, dispensaries, hospitals, and other things. Well, the Indian people had to go back to their native medicine only. So the whites and the Akims once again became very popular, and the British actually allowed whites and Akims to you know, operate in the private hospitals and also public hospitals because they came to know that the European medicines uh, could they exist only with the indigenous medicines because people showed more interest in 
what's called uh, native medicines and uh, in india at present we are having the pandemics as you know pandemic uh, is a disease which actually uh, you know you know uh, affects people globally at the uh, in a wide area after 1947 we come across many diseases in india whether it is uh, uh, plague in surat or sars or nifa or hepatitis or um, uh, swine flu um, or uh, what's called uh, other things but uh, no diseases actually affected india as uh, the present day uh, what's called uh, uh, corona virus and as far as corona virus is concerned well uh, you may know uh, you, you all know and they already uh, always you read in newspapers what kind of attitude the government is actually uh, exhibiting what kind of policies government is actually framing and what kind of action government is taking so quarantine which was popular for about 800 years in is also uh, being adopted quarantining and all and gardening of the area etc etc uh, spanish flu actually popularized wearing of mask and it is also being followed and one important thing that we have to note is that we have not framed a, a new epidemic disease act uh, even after independence and we are actually depending upon the old colonial era epidemic diseases act of 19, uh, 1897 and on the basis of only we are actually dealing with these things and um, because of that because of that um, uh, well states have a lot of power and the center cannot of course these states uh, you know to take uh, very strong measures uh, under this act of course indians uh, india has framed some guidelines for example national disaster management act it has passed and uh, management of biological disaster guidelines it has also uh, framed and uh, it is also you now uh, thinking of uh, uh, you know passing an act called public health prevention control and management of epidemics bioterrorism and disaster bill 2017 which actually seeks to repeal the epidemic law of in 1897 and i think that, that will be that will give more power to the center to follow a uniform policy uh, as far as uh, the indian uh, states are concerned well <clears throat> one in in conclusion what i would like to say is that civilizations always existed uh, with diseases only and um, one of the very famous historians by name uh, arnold tynbee arnold joseph tynbee uh, in his uh, work the story of civilization he actually talks uh, talks about what's called um, the challenge and response theory and he says that every civilization actually faces some challenges and when it faces some challenges well if the civilization fails to offer a very powerful response the civilization will be destroyed and we have seen that uh, throughout the history the the people uh, or the mankind actually showed great resistance uh, towards uh, these uh, uh, diseases though there was uh, heavy casualties uh, civilization still survived and we have reached the 21st century and this pandemic is one of the challenges that our civilization is facing and we can definitely say that we have every capacity uh, you know to show very effective you know response and uh, save our civilization because uh, this is how we actually uh, responded in in history and today we are in a much much better position because our health services are very good and our capacity uh, to uh, invent new medicines or new curative uh, what's called uh, medicines are very, very much very strong and therefore we can be much more confident uh, than what we used to be uh, in uh, in 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 uh, responding to this challenge and we can definitely hope that we will come out victorious in our battle with the pandemic thank you thank you sir for the wonderful session we have a few questions from the participants sir uh, the first one goes this way uh despite learning the challenges of pandemics from the history why was there a delay in who interventions in containing the spread of covid-19 causing a colossal loss of human lives and paralysis of economic growth well i can answer this question only as a history student and not as an economist or a medical uh, 
uh, expert. And uh, as far as World Health Organization is concerned, it is being criticized uh, uh, by uh, various uh, nations, especially the United States of America. And whether World Health Organization was slow in responding to the challenge or not, we do not know because one thing is very clear that uh, the World Health Organization uh, never imagined uh, that uh, such a situation as this would emerge. And also, it is said that uh, when this virus actually broke out in Wuhan, in the Hubei province of uh, Wuhan in China, um, uh, it was not uh, publicized. Though a doctor actually you know, um, alarmed the government, uh, and alerted the government uh, to take action. Well, the Chinese government did not make it published and uh, it was, um, you know, confined, uh, it was hidden uh, and uh, for a very long time people could not come to know. And by the time the world came to know or the World Health Organization came to know, well, it became very virulent. And therefore, uh, condemning the World Health Organization in a very uh, you know, serious manner is uh, not good for the very existence of this organization because that played a very major role in wiping out uh, uh, polio, in wiping out what's called uh, smallpox and all. Whereas any epidemic for that matter or pandemic affects economic activities. Uh, definitely it will affect economic activities, but human um, mankind will have to tolerate these things and uh, come up with the solutions than, you know, indulging in any kind of, uh, you, know, you know, blame game or identifying and uh, what's called people and uh, apportioning the blame. Thank you, sir. There's another question. Were there any lockdowns or closing of ins educational institutions, etc., previously? Yeah, um, um, under Epidemic Diseases Act, um, everything was shut down. Schools were shut down, colleges were shut down, markets were closed down, even what's called festivals were also not allowed and pilgrim centers were also completely uh, you know kept under um, uh, what's called surveillance people were not allowed to go there movement of people were also not allowed but movement of people could not be controlled at that time in, in previously uh, people started uh, moving out of Punjab, moving out of bengal to the rural areas fearing death and they became carriers of you know this disease and it became very widespread even in the 1890s and um, uh, in the first decade of the 20th century and now also uh, what we can say is that the closing down of these institutions and other things uh, to some extent give some opportunity and a breathing space for government to uh, take up some preventive measures to preventive pressure measures and at the same time to uh, create facilities to deal with uh, uh, the situation that would uh, in the later stages become very deadly. So as far as the India is concerned, we actually observed lockdown in the beginning. And this lockdown actually helped the government to create facilities to meet the greater challenge. And if it had not been any lockdown, the virulence would have spread in a violent manner as it had uh, taken place in America and it would have created a problem for uh, um, what's called uh, the Indians. I think it was a good measure for some. And this measure is not a permanent measure, it's for a temporary measure. I think it has yielded some result, good results. Thank you, sir. There's another question here. Uh, a participant would like to know your suggestion to government and other agencies concerned in order to be prepared for future such pandemics. And his second question is, there are so many experts in our country on all topics, but why aren't they considered and given importance during such time? In the first question, I could not catch it properly. First, first uh, question. Yes, your suggestion. Okay, it's uh, your suggestion to government and other agencies concerned in order to be prepared for future such pandemics. Yeah. No, the, the thing is that we have to upgrade our medical uh, facilities uh, regularly. You know, recently, there was a, uh, a, a video clipping which I actually watched. In that, in the year 2014, 
he said that the health care facility should be created on regular basis and regular basis keeping a, 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 you know you know in view uh, some accidental breakout of epidemics after 5 years or 10 years so in the year uh, 2014 he made the statement he said that when you create a you know you know medical facilities and other things and upgrade of medical we have to keep uh, in mind uh, what's called the situation um, uh, that would exist after 5 years hence and you see after 5 years pandemic actually broke out in america and americans started uh, what's called uh, scrambling um, for facilities and all those things so our request to the government should be that you know health services should be um uh, you know you know upgraded on a regular basis so that any kind of situ- this kind of situation uh, you know can be met very effectively whenever it actually breaks out this is like uh, army keeping its uh, weapons okay sir thank you sir and our final question okay sir one last question oh, sorry for that's okay sir okay. one last question sir despite experiencing the pros and cons of epidemics and pandemics under colonialism and after health infrastructure is not promoted to realize the inclusive health care as envisioned in indian health policy so your opinion on this sir uh, indian health policy whether there is a, in a, what's called a health policy as such and when did the indian government actually formulate a health policy uh, that should be is you know looked into and then only we can what's called find out the lacuna or the drawbacks in that particular policy and frame an inclusive health policy but uh, the government is at it i think no the inclusive health policy in the sense you know the uh, national health care and social security etc etc is being incorporated into our health policy um, on a regular basis and so many facilities are being given to uh, indian people uh, whether in uh, treatment or whether in uh, what's called uh, availing uh, facility at a cheaper variety and uh, whether it is uh, what's called creating new hospitals etc etc or whether promotion of private hospitals um, and um, supporting the research in med- in, in the medicine and health issues etc etc these things are taking place on a regular basis and whenever government actually you know comes across some kind of lacuna or drawbacks in particular policy well they will actually remove them and make the policy more and more inclusive i think we are actually um doing that and uh, it is actually evolving i think the policy is evolving i think okay thank you sir thank you for clarifying all the doubts of the participants uh, over to uh, professor rakshit sir for the vote of thanks good afternoon to everyone who were present virtually in national webinar on epidemic and pandemic india's experience under colonialism and after on behalf of peasant women's college i rakshit shetty from the department of history take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks firstly i would like to thank our resource person professor lokesh k department of studies in history mangalore university mangala gangotri konaje for accepting our invitation and being with us despite of his busy schedule thank you so for such a informative and wonderful session i take this opportunity to thank secretary of wnes and our correspondent shri k devanand pai for a always being 
there with us and uh, supporting us. Thank you, sir. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our management member and correspondent, Bazin Pew College, the Ganesh Krishnabad, for his support. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty, for extending his help and support at every stage of the preparation of the webinar. Thank you, sir. I sincerely thank Professor Ganesh Pai Yan Achuri, History Department, for taking up the initiative for the webinar and organizing it. I would also be very grateful to Professor Sayyad Kadar, IPFC coordinator, and Dr. Pravin Kumar KC, NAC coordinator, for all their support. My heartful thank to Mr. Uh, Ravindra Murthy and uh, Ritesh Kumar for uh, providing the technical assistant. My thank to photographer Mr. Basco. My heartly thank to all my dear colleagues for their support. Last, last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants for uh, actually participating this webinar, a great success. Finally, I would like to thank each one of you who contributed directly and indirectly towards the success of this webinar. Please note uh, the feedback link will be shared in the chat box. Thank you, uh, one and all. Thank you.